Our talk title today is Edging God Out. E-G-O. Edging God Out. Many, many years ago, a great teacher walked onto a stage and in front of a packed house looked out at the audience and said, the quality of your life is directly proportional to the quality of your questions. I thought that about that for a minute and I went, the quality of my life is directly proportional to the quality of my questions. So if I ask lazy questions, I guess I'm going to get a lazy life. If I ask powerful questions, questions that, that bring a deeper introspection into our lives, then I would expect to get a more powerful experience. Uh, this is new thought at its very basics. What we think about, we bring about. What we ask about, what we make inquiry about, actually leads us to a greater experience, understanding of, as my bio said, creating the life you truly desire. With over 20, 20 almost 22, 23 years of experience now, in this philosophy, I have found there are a group of questions that are even more powerful than most of the basic questions that we ask. And we're going to get to those today. But before we get there, I need to take you on a little bit of a journey with me, if you're willing. In 2016, 15, 16, 15, 14, 13? Sorry, 14. <laughs> we were living here in Lafayette, across the street from Debbie and Jim. And what I was doing in ministry wasn't really working for me any longer. And we had applied to a, a few different communities around the country, and a call came. And the call said, Washington. And we packed up our family, and we packed up our kids, and off we drove. A 26-foot U-Haul that we loaded in the snow with a car trailer behind that and another car behind that with two dogs, a cat, two kids, and more houseplants than we could count. And off we went. And after a couple of days' journey, we were a few hours outside of Portland, and the phone rang. Now, this was the first time in the trip that my beloved had come up into the front truck with me and made my brother sit with the kids in the back car, in the car in the back. And the phone rang, and I want you to remember there's always a phone call involved. <laughs> Great change is preceded by the phrase, and then the phone rang. <laughs> and the phone rang, and all I heard was, I am so sorry, Mrs. Brzezinski, but, and my brain checked out. I'm not really, sh I know the hands were on the wheel. Something was driving that vehicle, but I was in a place of what does this mean? Not really the most powerful or empowering question. And after a few months, a few moments talk, she hangs up the phone and looks at me, and I said, what was that? And she says, we don't have a house to move into. We were scheduled to move into a house the next day at 11 a.m. We had an appointment to meet with everybody to put down the money to get the keys to unload the truck. We had people, stacks of people, ready to come help us unload that truck. And here we are driving down I-84 into Portland, and we got nowhere to go. That's when she asked a really powerful question. So what do we do? <laughs> I said, will you start praying? Because I got to get this truck to Portland. And when we get there, we'll figure it out. But you start praying. We pulled into Portland a few hours later. I opened up my laptop. And there was a little purple dot on the program we were using the, the software, the, the, the website where we were looking for houses. It was a little purple dot, right where I had always thought would be a cool place to have a house, but there was never any purple dot in that area. 
And it wasn't there when we closed the laptop and drove away from Lafayette. Now it was about 5.15 in the afternoon, and what I had learned was the real estate agents and the rental companies, they don't answer the phone after five o'clock. But somebody did answer. I made that phone call and someone answered because they weren't a real estate agent, they weren't a company, they were a friend doing a friend a favor. What they didn't know is they were creating a miracle in our lives. The next morning, I sent Laura and the kids ahead. My brother and I drove that slow old truck from Portland up into Olympia, Washington. Couldn't get the truck down into where the neighborhood was because the roads were too tight, so we left it up on the hill, and my brother and I walked down. And as I walked down, my beloved was walking up the hill. I said, what do you think? She says, it'll do. <laughs> I said, it'll do? She goes, I don't know. It'll do. <laughs> cool. Where are you going? She's like, I'm off on my way to the bank. You go take a look around. I'm going to get the money. You go sign the lease. Wouldn't you know it was a little after 11 o'clock that morning, and that truck was already empty and moved into our new home. We were on top of the world. Everything we had wanted, all that we had worked for, the thing, the sweat, the blood, the tears, everything we had put into this, it was all right there. And it was all ours. It was all ours for about seven months. And about seven months later, it all came crashing down. And this story isn't about how it came crashing down or who did what or who was in the wrong or who was in the right. I, we live in a world of oneness. Just wasn't right. It wasn't the thing. I remember the phone call. Remember, there's always a phone call. Yeah. It was about 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. We had a great day with the community. And I was actually sitting in my car, meditating in contemplation, asking questions about the future of this community and where it was headed and what was, and what was next. And the phone rang. And I looked at it. And it was somebody that I didn't think should be calling me on a Sunday afternoon with somebody way up higher in the organization that, why are you calling me? Robert, I'm so sorry to be the one to tell you this. The board's gonna ask for your resignation at your board meeting this afternoon. The next couple of questions I asked might not be considered too ministerial. <laughs> They've been abbreviated in today's lexicon to a few letters. And then I calmed down. And then I remembered what this philosophy teaches. What we think about, we bring about. If I ask powerful questions, I'm going to have a powerful experience. And so I said, spent the next few hours not telling my beloved what was going on, but asking powerful questions. Like, how do I fix this? How do I convince them that they're wrong? How do I save this? How do I turn this off? Well, okay, so those are not the most empowering questions, right? By the time the meeting was left, was over, I knew our time in Olympia would come to an end. I knew we wouldn't be staying there. I knew that somehow, me, this guy, the guy with all the right training, the guy with all the right experience, the guy with all the right people in my corner cheering me on and telling everybody, the rising star. Not gonna happen. It's done. And I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I went through a very long and very deep and very hidden depression. Because for the next few years, if you ask me how I was doing, I would tell you, great, things are good, family's good, life is good, figuring out what's next for me. But inside, I was in pain. Inside, I hurt. 
I asked Jeffy to read that quote today. One, because it's got the word ego in there, and that's the theme of the talk, transcending the ego. But more because of that last piece, where Mr. Beckwith, Reverend Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, I think that's all the names he has, <laughs> where he reminds us that it all comes back to the fear. See, I was afraid. I was afraid of what people would think of me. I was afraid what people would say if I showed up wearing a pride outfit for a change. It's not my normal, I like this though. I can't take it with me, it's not mine, but I'm gonna get the most out. I was afraid. What's gonna happen to my kids? What's gonna happen to my family? What's my wife gonna think? What are we gonna do? I moved everybody halfway across the country and it's a pretty big failure. Luckily, I have a really good partner in the middle of this. And one evening, after some deliberation, the kids came down from upstairs for dinner, and they said, Mom, Dad, we need to have a talk. Now, anybody that's ever been in a long-term relationship knows what it means when your partner says, we need to have a talk. We want to go back to Colorado. We don't want to go anywhere else. We don't want to try to make it here. We know that you feel we can go anywhere, but we want to go back to Colorado. We know people there, there's, there's support there, there's community there, let's go back to Colorado. So for a few months later, a few months later, somehow my beloved got in the, the car with the kids and took off before me, left me to pack the house and the truck drive back to Colorado, and I arrived back here in Colorado in the middle of 2016. Now we're getting, we're getting into the right, remembering my dates again. But the depression hadn't, it was only beginning. It was really only just beginning. There's an old saying in this philosophy, you can bury your head in the sand, but once you know the truth, you can't deny it. You can pretend that you don't know the principles of this philosophy. You can pretend that you don't understand how prayer works or how meditation works or how the power of, the, of our thought and our belief works, but the truth is you're in this room, which means you know that it is true, and as much as you might want to try to hide from it, believe me, I tried, you can't hide from it. The truth will always win out. The truth will always catch up with you. For me, it kind of caught up with me in 2020. Before all the weirdness. It was actually January of 2020. And one of my mentors, one of my, my greatest teacher, my first teacher in all of this, he called me. Remember, there's always a phone call involved. <laughs> He called me and he said, how are you doing? I said, you don't want to know. You don't want to hear it. No, I do, I do. How are you doing? And I let him have it. And as he has always been a great teacher, he asked me the question, a very powerful question, a question that I've asked countless clients and people and those seeking advice and counsel over 20 some odd years now, he asked me the question that I asked everybody else and I didn't have an answer. He said, how's your spiritual practice? I said, oh, I'm a minister, what do you mean how's my spiritual practice? How's your spiritual practice? And I had to admit to him that Kind of didn't have one. It's kind of burnt out, done with all this. Even to the point, and I thought it was kind of, I thought I had hit rock bottom when I was driving for Uber and Lyft during this time. But I'll tell you, I really knew I hit rock bottom because I had taken a job in telephone sales. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. I don't, I'm pretty sure I didn't call any of you, so please don't hold it against me. And what he said was, Robert, I want you on a 30-day visioning quest. 
For 30 days, I want you to use the visioning process. And I want you to prove to me that you're igniting that spirit, uh, that, that, that spiritual practice within yourself again. Now, for those that might not be familiar with the visioning practice, it's really what I, I like to say, make it say, I like to say it is meditative inquiry. We all know how to meditate, right? And in your meditation, you ask some powerful questions. Questions like, what is the highest vision for my life? What is my soul's purpose? What do I need to let go of in order to have all this? What do I need to hold on to in order to have all this? What do I need to do to have this? What don't I know about what I need to do to have this life I truly desire, a, a grand vision for my life? And so the vision process is really meditative inquiry. Sit in the silence, get yourself. I said, I can do this. That sounds like a big thing, but I can do this. And for 30 days, from the middle of January to near the end of February, every day, I would take half an hour, 40 minutes, and I'd sit in the stillness, and I would ask myself this series of questions. And then I'd scribble on a notebook the answers. And every afternoon when I was done, I would take a quick picture of it and I would send it to my mentor. He was known to be a little wily. He had told me that if I didn't send him the picture to prove I was doing the practice, that we were done. No more phone calls, no more crying on his shoulder, no more seeking advice. Do this. I now understand that that was the voice of God speaking through a really great friend who happens to a little bit of a wise guy streak in him, if you will. But he did the practice. And over 30 days, what emerged is what is now New Thought Media Network and even more. Now, some of these things, some of the pieces, were actually already in play. Some of the pieces of what emerged had been emerging through this practice for years. In 2008, I was sitting in a classroom at Mile High Church in my ministerial classes and parts of, the, of what is now New Thought Media Network emerged in those visioning sessions. I'd been asking the right questions and then I just sort of stopped and forgot or stuck my head in the sand. See, I believe that we are on the verge of a great shift on, in this country, on this planet. Humanity is truly awakening to our oneness. We are waking up to the fact that we don't need to protect ourselves from some imaginary tribe or some concept of poison or some way that we're not enough. We don't have to live in that state of fear when we live in the state of oneness. When we live in that place of remembering that you and I are brothers and sisters, that we are siblings, that we are beyond the, the, the labels, that we are beyond the names and the, and the concepts and the religions and all of that, deeply we are one. And when we come to that realization, we can push aside all that other stuff, the doubt, the fear, the, the questions, that have no power. They give us no real insight. I hadn't planned this, but Spirit just reminded me that I've been in a long-running debate, if you will, with a number of my friends and colleagues, and most recently my beloved, around the validity of the question, why? I don't like it, personally. Everybody says you gotta get to your why. Why do this? Why, why, why? I'm not a big fan of the why question. I like questions like, what is my purpose here? How can I best serve in this capacity? And I want you to know this practice can actually be really easy and it can be really applicable to your daily life. If you work in an office building of any sort, there are these great little chambers all on every floor 
that are segregated by gender where you can go in and shut the door. There's actually a little cube inside the bigger cube where you can go in and shut the door, sit down. Nobody's going to bother you, I promise. <laughs> and just be in the stillness and ask yourself, what's the highest vision for me in this next meeting? What's the, what, what is it that I need to let go of in order for this next thing to go well? Maybe, maybe, maybe you have that luxury you're not working in an office building. Maybe you're out doing something in your yard. Or you've got a special project. Or you're, or you're in service to a community. Or, or a nonprofit. And we can ask the questions like, what do, I, what do I need to let go of so I can be more available to this? What is it that no longer serves me in moving into this great becoming that I want to be. For many, many years, we've been taught that visionary leadership is the follow me. I got a great idea, come follow me. Let's shoot a rocket out into space. Better yet, let's just send a sports car into space. Whatever it might be, I believe that is not truly visionary leadership. I think that's ego-based leadership. Visionary leadership is letting the vision call us, letting the vision reveal to us through these questions what it is we're here to do. As I look back, it's no wonder it didn't work in Washington. I was leading from my ego. Remember, I was the guy that had all the answers. I had all the education. I had all the certificates, all the backing, all the cheerleaders, all the people. But I was letting the ego run it. I was edging God out of the equation. I was not listening to the divine urge, the divine voice, that still small voice that sometimes is a roaring roaring voice that says, just get over yourself, Robert, go do this thing, will you? Happened about, what, eight weeks ago. Down 23 pounds in eight, seven, six, eight, seven, seven, seven weeks. weeks. Three pounds a week. Ooh. Thank you. Ooh. Because I finally, in that part of my life, listened to the divine and <laughs> what it was trying to tell me. Four or five months ago, they involved with a learning community because I got sick and tired of seeing their commercials. And in a fit one night, I just yelled out, God, when will you stop showing me this commercial? And then I heard the voice say, when you do something about it, dummy. <laughs> oh, you want me to do something about it? That's why you keep putting this in front of me. We can ask the questions and step easily into what's next for our lives. We can bury our head in the sand and God's going to keep knocking. And God's going to keep showing us the signs. The universal power of oneness will continually reveal to you what is the next highest step for you in your life. Even if you're beyond that time where people say we should be retired. I honestly don't think any of us actually retire. We kind of rewire a little bit. Eh? But I don't think any of us is done because we're here. And I think that means there is something within you that is calling you your greatness. There is a seed within you that is calling you to your own magnificence. And if you will listen, the way will be made. And the way will be shown. And you never know. You might end up with some pretty cool new outfits to go with it. <laughs> Can't guarantee that part. <laughs> there is a power for good in the universe greater than we are. And there are those that ask, are we using that power? And we, there are those that ask, are we letting that power use us? And I believe it's a both and. 
We have to be willing to listen to how the power wants us to show up, and then we have to be willing to show up. And I believe that's what you're doing by being here on a Sunday evening. So I want to invite you to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back. Don't edge God out. Don't push the divine aside. Embrace it. It's one of the best questions and one of the greatest questions of it all. What am I here to embrace? So I may reveal the grand vision for my life. And what I know is I know that as you reveal a grand vision for your life, you will simultaneously reveal the vision for this organization, for this community, the organizations outside of you that you may serve. And that's how we change the world. That's how we create a world that works for all. Thank you for being with us. How about some more music? Thank mm -hmm. you.